in today's Beginners Ink and Watercolor video, you're gonna surprise yourself with just how fun and how beautiful you can make simple scenes. And simplicity is the key. We're gonna be taking things which don't look simple, but making them easy, making them effortless. And by the end, you'll learn lots about different ink techniques, about different watercolor techniques that you can take away to sketch any scene, to sketch your hometown, your house, or your travels. And with that, let's jump in, let's sketch, and let's have a bit of fun. All we need for today's video are pigment liners or fine liners, basically waterproof pens. I've got two sizes, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 millimeters. Um, one size will do as well. Just make sure that they're waterproof. So somewhere it will say indelible, waterproof, archival, something like that. Or you can use a fountain pen with waterproof ink and carbon ink by platinum and sketch ink by Ruhr and Klingler are good examples. I've then got my normal watercolors. You can check those out on the supplies link below. And just a couple of brushes, a size 12 round and a 3 8 of an inch flat brush. Just different things to try out. For watercolors, if you don't have any yet, or you know, if you're looking to expand your color range, then student grade sets, the cheap sets by Meaden, by Winsor Newton, they're great to get started with. I'm using Etcher paper today, a watercolor block. Um, this is half cotton, 50% cotton, and it's 300 grams per square meter, and it's cold pressed. That gives it a really lovely texture. And that's all we need to get started and to have a bit of fun with our sketch today. What I'm going to be doing is talking you through the processes. So I'm going to sketch on the big side of this and I'm going to use this side of my paper to show you examples and to do thumbnails and work our way through this sketch. So with that, let's get started. Now, step one for my sketching process is always the idea of shapes. And what I mean by shapes is the idea of literally square, triangle, circle, and the ability to see those shapes in a scene. So if we look at our scene here, we can find that the main house is kind of like a, a square. And then on its head, it's got a rectangle with wonky sides. And then it's got squares in it, which are the windows. And we can make them all the same, or we can find that they're slightly different sizes. It, it doesn't matter. There's another sort of floating door here, because this used to be a canal. So this, this house actually used to accept deliveries, of course, from the canal. Underneath it, we've got like a long rectangle. And like so, you see, we just really simply building things up. And that's our step one, shapes. What we don't want to do is make them rigid and boring. So here, look, my lines are quite like, whoa, hard. And what we have actually got is just a series of shapes on the page. So the way we get around that is by making our lines interesting. So we want interesting lines. That's adding a little texture to the line. That's letting the line be gentle in places, hard in others. That allows you to bring things forward. So a really silly, simple example of what I mean is if we sketch some fruit and I make an apple here at the front, nice and bold, then there's another one in the back, really gentle, another one in the back, even more gentle. Perhaps there's a banana coming forward. So as we get there, it comes forward and then gets faint as it goes back behind the other apples and things. And by doing that, by using little bits of hatching and texture, suddenly our fruit are more interesting than if we just done circle, circle, rectangle, which is basically what this is. So hopefully that makes sense. And now with these simple ideas, we can just jump on here. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna just find those key shapes. And obviously we're gonna be a bit bigger than this. But the key and the biggest challenge people have when they're starting out sketching is not accepting that you need to simplify. And it doesn't matter what kind of art you're doing, oil painting, acrylics, everything requires some degree of simplification unless you're gonna be spending hundreds and hundreds of hours to create a single piece of art and make it photorealistic. And in my opinion, I mean, that's incredible talent required and incredible hard work, but it's also not that fun. And I have a camera for that. So for me, I love this process of simplifying. And hopefully you can see what I'm doing. I'm just moving around 
And I'm finding those key shapes. So even in the background, we can find, I don't know what this is. I think it's a, maybe it's even a door or something, but it's a shape which allows me to put it into the image. Here again, there's some things going on. I don't really know what they are, but I can see the shape which allows me to put it in my image without making anything up and yet make it still actually fit what's really going on. We can continue this shape down at the soft line between the, the two buildings. And we get to about here and maybe a little lower. Actually, I think this is about right. So we can see I'm measuring here. What I'm trying to do is look at the image and go, look, the distance between here and this line is about the same as here and where this line comes in. So a little bit of comparative measurement can make your life much easier. And start to get things accurate and in proportion. You can then bring in this line. And then look, we've got all these crazy plants and things going on. And they're not so hard if we focus on the shape. And the shape isn't every leaf. We cannot see every leaf. As soon as we do that, look, we've got this really black. We may as well just blacked in the page. What we can see instead is we can see these climbing, loose, semi-abstract shapes. And if we focus on that, well, suddenly, look, we can see these reeds form this shape, which goes into some of these climbing plants, which form a kind of scraggly shape going up the wall. We can make more sense of this later when we when we get to uh, adding a little more texture and detail. That's coming up very shortly. But first, we just find the key shapes. And the shape at the top here does have these like reed-like things poking out of it. So we can find those, no problem another little clambery shape here. This is where these, these lines being interesting is really important because we could have simplified this into really basic shapes, but then it wouldn't look like the plants. It wouldn't take on the essence of the plants. It would just be a kind of silly little shape in the front. And there we go. So just like that, we've built in the plants and we'll make sense of them as we move forward. Next, let's find some of the other little shapes. We've got the, the window shapes up here. Another one up here, it's a little bit smaller, isn't it? So we'll make it a little bit smaller today. And if you want to simplify and keep it the same size, that's also okay. Got this window, it's more of a more of a square than the others, which are more of a rectangle. And again, got a little dividing line in there. This one's a funny shape, it's sort of out to the side and very narrow. Then we've got this uh, bizarre door, which is a little bit lower. That's a bit of comparative measurement. Again, we find that it's a bit lower than the other. The other windows we just go look it fits across about there and then in there we can start thinking about texture because look this door's got lovely sort of planks of wood making it up so we've, we've done our shapes now really haven't we the, the scene has come to life with shapes and we can move on to step two which is going to be texture and hatching and shading and this is where we find value but we also find the other aspects of the scene so we've got all these bricks bricks it's tempting to then draw every single brick and make a big mash of bricks but i'll show you what i do what i do just a few little lines look we just dot in a few and then that tells you the whole story it tells you the entire story of this set of well this set of bricks we don't need to do more than that i've actually forgotten a shape here which i think works quite well to just show that this is a house as well so i'm just going to add in a shape as well what other textures do we have? Well, we've got the textures of the roof, and it's the same idea. I'm not going to draw every tile. Instead, I'm going to get the idea of all these long horizontal lines with a little occasional kind of vertical nudge coming down. Then we, we mentioned the textures of all these plants. Well, it can be really simple. It's got all these reeds. The reed textures are just these long lines. We can join some of these lines up with the top. We can get a lot of them coming out of the bottom. We can find that there's a little sort of textural difference between here and then here, these climbing plants, which these climbing plants have more like little loopy leaf shapes, don't they? So we can go up and just start adding some of these little loopy leaf shapes. In. Really simple, very, very simple ideas. More of these little reed lines. And focusing, this is almost hatching. So hatching is the idea of filling up an area with marks like this, and then you go from light to dark. Well, we could do that with textural marks as well. So we're getting these kind of reeds and we're finding a lot of the shadow, there's little patches of shadow here, a lot of the shadows at the bottom 
of the read so we do more read marks and like that you're building up the shape of the scene as well this line interesting sort of comes across doesn't it we kind of have a little line coming across here and again maybe then we just need to explain that actually underneath this little line there's still lots of bricks here we've then got this river it's all green very confusing but what we'll do we'll just do some little water kind of marks showing that there's these horizontal ripples flowing along and just remember there's a bit of perspective so as we go further and further these lines rotate round and round and like that we're very almost there a couple more bits of context for the textures so there's a roof here and i missed a little bit of this shape here didn't i missed this edge coming out we need that to make it make sense it's gone a bit bold here as well but we'll fix that later don't worry over here another little roof and again it's useful just to have these textures because it shows you that you've kind of uh, well it shows of you very easily this and this and this are all the same thing we've got the church in the background i'm actually going to leave that out today it's in it it's sort of just poking out the top it's not adding a huge amount to the scene for me if we wanted to include it it would again just be the idea of simple shapes so you would draw the simple sides like so and you can easily add it in and perhaps if we were stood further back you'd get more reason to add it in but today i don't think we need to keeping on with these sort of texture lines is where we can then start finding just some of the shadow and doing some really simple hatching so i'm going to hatch underneath here really simple hatching underneath to show the shadow coming straight down we could do the same just at the bottom here we could just hatch now there isn't really shadow here but what we're doing is we're showing how this surface goes from horizontal or rather vertical to horizontal so we've changed the, the direction of hatching here and here to this and that helps the again the structure of the image it helps the viewer immediately understand what's going on and where what each of these very simple blocks really means over here we've actually got like some metal girders i think but we can replace them both with texture and with some simple hatching so these might be hatching they might be the metal kind of girders or whatever is going on behind there it might even just be a fence i'm not sure but again i'm taking an idea from the scene i'm just putting it onto my version of the scene and then what are we missing well we kind of this is framed quite nicely but it's very symmetrical so one one thing i'm going to add in at the end of our ink work is just this little overlapping tree that overlapping tree can come down and it can look provide that asymmetry and asymmetry in composition is really important last bit i think actually i always say there's a last bit there's always something else you can do and one of the keys is to stop uh, before you've done too much really so and if you really really think it's important should you keep going here i think it's quite important to get a little bit more contrast in these windows because if you squint you can tell that these windows are in fact one of the darkest elements in the scene and like that now we have rather a cute little sketch put together just through simple shapes and simple textures next we're going to be doing colors and that's in two stages firstly loose and light and then bold and still fairly loose but a little bit more free and let's just go straight in and see why these two steps are important so what we're going to use is some nice light but warm colors so we can see these bricks have got a kind of orangey feel there's some yellows coming through now if we're light and loose what we can do is we can use some orange and then this is, this is Quinacridone Sienna, by the way, for anyone who's interested. And again, you can find my full palette listed on my supplies link. By keeping it light, what we can then do, add the bits of yellow to get those ideas of the yellow coming through. This is Hansa Yellow Medium. And then even, I've got a little palette off to the side. I've got some Indian Red. We can just drop that in and get that sort of varied, really interesting wash of colour. Do you see how this wall is so much more interesting? than just a simple block of colour which it might be sometimes tempting to do underneath we've got more like white almost just white brick so i'm actually going to use a little bit of blue do you see how that's basically blue but if i'm really gentle with it that blue will just create a gentle tone really soft bit of tone that suggests just shadow so and that's the kind of thing we can see it just suggests a tiny 
wash of tone, something more than just empty space. Up here, a little bit more of the same kind of colours. Remember, plenty of water. We can basically just mix on the page. What I don't want to do, I've overdone it here. Do you see how this is way brighter than here? So I need to just pick some of that up with a bit of water. Or the other way to do it is to enrich something over here so that we bring the balance of colours back. Because we painted light and loose, look, I was able to correct my mistakes. If you're painting really specific, if you're making loads of dabby brush strokes, we all end up with is really bold, complicated colours which you can't correct if things go wrong. I'm going to jump to the top now. So I'm going to do this lovely sky. And this lovely sky is a bright blue, isn't it? There are lots of ways you can do skies. For me, I'm going to start in a very loose way again. Look, just splashes of blue. Now I can come in, clean my brush, dry it a little bit, and we can just connect these little splashes. You could use any blue, cerulean blue and ultramarine blue are really common primary coloured blues. And then we can start just touching in some more. We can even mix blue. So if I use some turquoise, this is cobalt turquoise, we can get this kind of fun, varied sky. Really gentle, really soft sky. And maybe a little bit more blue here and here. You know, just keep playing. Keep it wet though. As soon as this dries, you're going to end up making things busy. So you need to keep it wet, keep things moving, touch a little bit here, a little bit there. Try not to overdo it. And often overdoing it is a is a something you learn. You learn just, oops, I did too much this time, and next time I know to do a little bit less. That's that's the kind of trial and error process for all artists in discovering techniques and styles which work for you. So for me, I know that that's as much as I should do. I think any more, and I might overwork it. Now I'm just going to fill in the gaps. So we've got the, the roof and we've got some of the greens down here. Now this comes to a really key concept though, and that is a concept of negative space. So we don't want to fill our sketch entirely with colour. Instead, what we want to do is we don't want to leave something to the imagination, some space. So I might just, for example, do this roof. And I'm going to use, this is Indian red. You can make a similar red with a little bit of blue uh, tucked into a nice warm red. And then I'm going to just apply some interest to it by adding a little bit of dark blue. This is an indigo I'm adding. And again, keeping it soft. And I'm, I like it when the colours blend and merge. So I like having everything join up a little bit. I know that's a personal thing. Colin, who I often paint with on this channel, um, doesn't like that. And that's great as well. He's got an amazing style. Then what I'm going to do, jump down to these greens. I think these greens would be fun if some of them had colour, but maybe again, there's some space for some negative space. So I'm going to just take a nice green. Again, you could mix it. I've got a favourite green, so I'm going to use my cobalt green. And I'm going to just pop that green in at the bottom and let it wash up. And there'll be some nice space at the top. And I might leave these climbing plants for now so that we don't get too much green mixing. And so we can see the idea of negative space, these empty spaces on the page. Under here, I might mix a little bit of turquoise and just see what happens. Turquoise is a greeny blue, and I know this is very green, but for me, I want to introduce a little bit more of the idea that it's water. So that's why I've got the greeny blue. But then look, I let these colours mingle, and it's like magic. I've got a really flowing green but blue river. And that's just because we don't try too hard. We let the colours do their own bit of magic. And like that, that's my first layer of colours done. That is our loose colours done. So I'm going to put this to one side, let things dry for 10 minutes, go make a cup of tea, coffee. We'll come back and see how, from this very simple step, we can suddenly bring it to life with our bold colours. And here we go. We are back and you can see things have dried and they're sort of a little bit more mellow than when they are wet. And that is the normal process in watercolours. They dry lighter. So we need to come back and we need to make something of some more of these colours. And let's just start with the focal point, the focal point being the house. So remember the colours we used before, we had a lovely bit of quinacridone sienna, nice bright orange. And what happens if we just layer that up? Do you see how we get a much darker colour? And this is why we work from loose to bold colours, because we can get the depth of colour later. What we don't want to do is overdo it too early. 
And if we try to get these really bold colours early, what you end up with instead is a really messy page, a really challenging page. Watercolours, whether you're sketching like me or you're trying to develop a really classic watercolour style, layers are vital. We cannot skip the layer stage. I need a little bit of, a little bit of blue to come down here. And do you see how that blue and the orange become quite a neutral colour and that gives us that shadow? This same blue with a little bit more darkness to it, a little bit of indigo, can also start making our windows. Remember we added that hatching, but now they can get their own little bit of colour as well in there. And you see how I'm not covering the entire of this house. I'm going to do a little bit more, so a little bit more of this, this red that we used before, which was rather nice. We can pop that in a couple of places, maybe under some of the windows, and again, come back, soften it, move it, keep it bold, but not overdone, not trying to be too clever. And then we leave some of that light shining through. Underneath, we've got this kind of slightly different wall, and I'm going to use a little bit more of the blue. And just pop in some little painterly strokes. Painterly is where you, you literally see the brush stroke as part of the process. Instead of trying to make it real, you show the, the kind of process. I love absolutely love that part of watercolours, having that kind of process evident in what we've done. And that's naturally what you do with ink. These marks aren't real. There is no outline to the house. And yet we leave the ink marks. And for me, exactly the same thing is brilliant to do in our watercolours. Here, I'm just gonna imply a little bit of a shadow. And you can see our shadow up here is already rather dry, isn't it? And when it dries, it becomes less impressive. So already, with our bold colors, we're finding we're having to move around and enrich them. Here, it might be nice to make our door really bold. And we could almost paint the, uh, the texture again, paint these, these wooden boards, leaving a little bit of white coming through. What else is there to do in our scene? Well, we've got the roof, haven't we? So again, I used a little bit of Indian red. You might have mixed red and blue and to get a deeper red. And here we can use our brush marks, our painterly marks to increase some tone, but also provide some texture. And again, I might soften it a little bit. So softening is where you come back. Could you see the difference? Hard lines, soft, gentle. So what I'm doing, cleaning my brush, a little bit of water, clean my brush again, and then we can soften it out. We get some texture, but we also get a little bit of life and light and a more subtle sort of effect coming through. Now, this is a bit where we just start sort of fiddling and at some point you realize, oh, I don't really know why I'm doing this. I don't know what the purpose is. And at that point, and that's coming up for me now, at that point, we sort of just have to step away and move somewhere else. So for me, the next obvious bit is to move to our greens. I'm not gonna touch the, the sky again because if I go on that, I'll get layers in my sky which doesn't ever feel natural to me. Some people can do that and get a nice effect. For me, I, I never go back to a sky, or almost never. I can now instead move to layering. And remember when we did this, we said we had more value, more darkness at the bottom. So we can layer our colours with these little painterly marks. We can layer our colours at the bottom. And in doing so, we are increasing the value, we're increasing the shadow. Then we've got the, the river. So a little bit of turquoise and green mixed together now. And we can just show we, we made up this shadow, right? That's fine though. We can now enhance our invented shadow with a little wash of that mixed colour. And again, now we soften it. And if we do these kind of horizontal marks, we'll get the feeling of the ripples on the uh, on the river, on the canal as well. And is there anything else that we actually really have to do? And I'm gonna say, there isn't really anything at this stage we have to do. We've done our loose colors, we've done our bold colors, we've talked about layers, and we're gonna move on to the final step, which is the finishing touches, where we're gonna get our bolder pen out, and we'll add a few more watercolors. Um, but before we do that, of course, we need our page to have dried. So here we are, we're nice and dry, and it's time for the finishing touches. This is where we sort of restructure what's going on. We find those key elements, we bring them forward. When I say bring them forward, I literally mean, remember, we talked about bold lines. If I make this apple bold, notice how it jumps off the page, it comes towards you. 
Well, we're going to do the same here. We're going to find those lines again, including what's happened with the watercolour. So that might mean we slightly change our original line. But in doing so, that object that we want to outline will come forward or come towards us. This enables us to work our, our sort of focal point a little bit harder to really show people what we want them to look at. What have we spent our effort and our energy on? A few of these lines, these textural lines can be bold and we can base them on the, the lines the watercolour has made. For example, look here, we've got this lovely yellow line so we can add a textural line around it. Same here, little line to come around some of these natural watercolour textures we've created. Here we're just, again, we can just bring key lines with the windows forward. Don't overdo things. So we don't want to turn this into a cartoon. And there is a risk when we go this bold that we can make it a bit cartoony. Or to be fair, you might want to turn it into a cartoon if that's your style. So in that case, remember that bold lines really are your friend. Here, another bold line, another bold line, just to separate these out. I can add a little bit more texture here to the lines now as well. And then here, we can just come and really add a lot more if we want to our, our reads using our bigger, bigger, more bold, interesting pen marks. Same in the foreground here, we can really show some of these ripples, being careful not to overdo it, of course. A few more bits of hatching if we want. And then the final finishing touches, where we have some fun with our colours, our boldest and brightest colours. So here, what we might do is start to introduce some brave touches. Maybe in this you decide you do want little bits of green to show, although this is negative space, we can still show kind of what it is, but, but not. <laughs> We're just doing those little suggestions. So these leaves can be done with really bold, thick paint. Then maybe we want a last attempt at layering up that shadow here. So we just come back in with our darkest paint. It's also another layer. So when we are layering up, we are increasing the value. We can do the same here, another layer of our darkest paint. Perhaps we want a couple of little highlight bricks. So we might introduce something nice and bold, like a little bit of red, just on a couple of these bricks. And that kind of gives us funny little highlights, just little touches, which uh, hopefully add something fun to look at. Here, this one went a bit fuzzy, a bit wrong, so I'm gonna just soften it out. And hopefully that works a bit better. A couple of other little highlights here and there, and maybe a few little blue highlights. When we've got our sort of shady bricks down here, we can add some little blues, a bit here and there, maybe even a bit more on our windows as well. Again, not covering up too much of our previous colors. We want that light coming through. And last but not least, just a few more kind of green ripples. That, that blue and green mix that we've used can just come into its own in the foreground. And before you know it, we're pretty much done. Now, last bit, I love adding splashes. I just do it by gently tapping my brush. For me, it's a really lovely touch. It really just brings a bit of light and randomness to uh, watercolours. And it's a unique thing to watercolours really as well, the quality of these splashes. You don't have to like this, and but as I always say, I'll do it so you can, <laughs> you don't have to. And if you do like that, then I'd encourage you to experiment, have a bit of fun and see how you can develop it. Last but not least, you might find a couple of bits you just want to retouch, maybe introducing this line coming across the whole building so that it kind of fits and makes sense going all the way across. Maybe a couple more little textural marks, but again, just don't overdo it. Take a step back, pop your signature on. I put my initials there and I like to hide a signature somewhere else in the line work and just feel proud for a moment of what you've done. You can always come back and add more, but you can't take away. So with that, I've finished my little sketch of my St. Neil's Canal. Um, if you enjoyed this, then check out in the description, I've got loads of really simple beginners tutorials on different types of ink and watercolor techniques. And subscribe to my channel and you'll get loads of regular videos to join in with. Um, with that, happy sketching. So thank you everyone for watching my little sketching videos. If you enjoy my content, please do subscribe to my channel because it makes me really, really happy. Thanks again.